So thank you very much to the HRB for inviting me to speak about a topic of uh, great interest uh, to me, which is challenges for wider adoption of big data, but particularly in an Irish context. But I think the, the talk by uh, Joel provides very interesting, you know, high level context and global uh, context. So this discussion will cover three different grounds. So I think the first one is to revisit the big data, the nature of the big data opportunity and how it translates in real life. The second one will look specifically at challenges we will need to overcome. And I'm talking about technical challenges, structural challenges, and political challenges. And uh, finally, I'm going to conclude with a case study of how they do it in Scotland, because we have a very, very interesting uh, situation in Scotland where they, they achieved to deploy an operational um, environment for the management of health research data and other public sector data. So I think a good place to start, really, is to revisit what we mean by big data. And the term really came, or at least the concept, uh, came in the late 90s by a gentleman from a Gartner looking at client data. And they identified that all of this data had either of three attributes in common, either very large volumes of data, or they were data changing at a very high velocity, or they were composed of a complex set of diverse data sets. So these are, these are the three pillars really of big data, volume, velocity, and variety. Subsequently, a number of platform vendors or academic groups decide to redefine the big data concept just so that they would be able to avail of the funding and support measures uh, deployed to support uh, the big data uh, revolution. And I'm not going to go into detail into that. You could argue it's semantics. Who cares if it's three, four, five, six, or seven Vs? But the bottom line, the side effect, I think, which is affecting us in Ireland the most, is that the importance of large data volumes has been diluted by this discussion. And indeed, we did not, in my opinion, we haven't supported uh, big data as in managing large volumes of data in a satisfactory manner in, in, in our country. All right, so I'll cover this later on. Looking at three concrete examples of these three pillars, of volume, velocity, and variety. I think the first one has been covered by uh, Joel in part earlier, which is a very significant, very rapid growth of health data. This example stops in 2015, but I'm told the trend line continues in 16, 17, and 18. Uh, this is for the US market. What's very interesting, the, the scale on the left-hand side is in petabytes, right? It is in petabytes. To give you context, we currently have in Ireland only two petabytes of storage for the whole academic research community, including uh, health research, incidentally. What's very interesting to look at is the growth of both imaging data and EMR data over time. So it's really, really growing at a very fast rate and continues to accelerate. The second one is from the world of logistics. And again, Joel mentioned it earlier. This is this anticipatory shipping. Actually, Amazon submitted and obtained a patent for this back in 2012. And the idea is that you're able to predict more or less the volume of a particular type of products that will need it in a particular geographic area. And you just define the end destination as the product is actually shipped to this particular region. So by anticipating your needs, they're able to bring down the cost and streamline the logistics of their uh, distribution. And the first one, I think, is very topical considering the rainfall outside. Uh, if rain continues like that for, for a day or two, we might end up in a situation where we're flooded, which is a common occurrence for us in, in Ireland. And this is a perfect example of big data problem based on variety. Why? Because it involves gathering data from a number of sources, a number of organizations, the National Meteorological um, uh, Organization, met Iran, includes both computer models data, include observation data from weather station, from satellite data. This is brought up with tidal information from the Marine Institute looking at 14 observation stations, computer models like ROMs. You look at the type of soil, the level of saturation, the capacity to absorb moisture, and the way in which the water runs off, depending on whether you have a built-in area or greenfield. So it's a very complex problem. You can add to this uh, the way water actually goes in rivers, river gauges, and of course, e electrical dams. Right. So this is a perfect example of big data. So trying to refocus the discussion on health for uh, this particular audience. Uh, this is a quote I came across on a regular basis, which is healthcare is the last major industry 
not to be transformed by the information age. So I think the, that quote first appeared, that quote by Andrew Morris, the CMO in Scotland, uh, the last, I think, four or five years ago, right? Uh, apparently, Bill Gates made very similar uh, comments. Now, it is a matter of opinion whether you think it is still true or not, but I would say certainly that we are underachieving in terms of transformation. The main challenge for me is integration. And I think this was illustrated in the final section of, of Joel's uh, discussion here, which is how to integrate this kind of consumer data into the global healthcare delivery, right? So you, you add all these new data sources from drug research, social media, uh, patient record, genomics, home monitoring, and so on, and how to integrate all this data within a coherent framework that assists you to improve healthcare delivery. And also something of particular interest to me is how is artificial intelligence or rather a specific branch of AI known as deep learning going to revolutionize uh, the way healthcare, the type of healthcare treatments uh, available to us. So deep learning, deep learning is very often referred to as artificial intelligence because everybody has heard of AI. There was plenty of movies and books on AI. Deep learning sounds a bit techy, sounds a bit geeky. So what is deep learning? Uh, Okay, well, the graph doesn't come, it's not too much of a problem. What you have to take on board, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. And basically what it tries to do is to mimic the way our brain analyzes data. So we don't do it in the conventional, sequential manner a computer program would work, but instead it analyzes patterns and infers uh, knowledge from this. Now, as Joel mentioned, in many respects, deep learning is a black art. It's, 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 a, it's a black box, right? So you have a number of frameworks available from various vendors. Some are better at analyzing images, some for language processing, some are better for voice recognition analysis. But we know one thing, they do work. We don't know why they work exactly, but we know they do work, right? Uh, what you have to take, if you have one thing to take from that slide, what is needed for deep learning is very large data sets, algorithms and skills to interpret, those, uh, the output, right, and computational power to actually process all this data, right? Um, I need to say also that data needs to be of particularly good quality. You cannot throw any type of data. Now, how is deep learning different from machine learning? Machine learning, as you throw data at some point, reaches a kind of plateau, and the quality of the prediction doesn't improve as you add more data. And the quality of, of deep learning, it is a self-learning method so the model keeps on improving itself as you add more data. So the more data, basically, and the higher the quality of, of the output. So this is a simple example from Stanford. Uh, Professor Fei Fei Li, who is one of the pioneers of deep learning, working with uh, Dr. Arnold Milstein in his medical school in Stanford, actually joined forces to say, what about applying AI for healthcare? And one particular example I liked, because it's very uh, easy to understand and very graphical, is using this as decision support, surgical support for burns. So they had a very, very small uh, database, of about 1,000 a thousand photos, about 1,600 burns. They were annotated by experts, different experts. The system goes through a, a stage known as training, so the network learns, basically, from the training set. And after, every time you submit a new uh, data set, it's able to come up with a sensible, a good uh, prediction, good advice. Uh, you can see here, she specified that with minimum amount of work, you could achieve 85% uh, accuracy, right? Uh, whereas a specialist apparently only achieved 40 to 70%. So that confirms many of the examples that uh, Joel indicated earlier in, in his talk. Now, closer to home, I think it's important to realize that some people here are actively involved also in uh, bringing the benefits of deep learning. Uh, and here this is uh, Professor Michelle Leach. I know she's somewhere in the audience. I've seen her from the Applied Radiation Therapy uh, Group at Trinity College. And so this is looking at personalized prostate radiation oncology. I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to, to comment on any of those different stages. Uh, please speak to Michelle if, if you have an interest in that domain. But basically, the objective is to bring deep learning techniques into the second pillar uh, to do the image segmentation, delineation, and so on. And what, what this will do, this will allow to, to maximize utilization of resources, and this will allow to actually remove variability that you uh, experience by using uh, through the human factor, basically. 
So an interesting topic. I think what's very interesting with big data also is a change of mindset. And instead of focusing on single technique and a single, I suppose, data set, is to look beyond that. How can I link up data sets from different domains? So there's great value to be gained by linking data sets from various different domains. So this photo here is a scan from a satellite, recently launched satellite from the Copernicus mission uh, from the European Space Agency called Sentinel-5P uh, precursor. And it gives you air quality for at a, at a level of seven kilometer uh, resolution. And they identify a number of air nasties, as they call it, from carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, aerosols, and so on and so forth. Right. And the beauty of it, so this, this map represents the southern coast of England. So Southampton is at the bottom in the center. You have London on the top right, which is surprisingly clean. What is interesting looking at the four pictures at the bottom is the level of variability you have from day to day, on how much air quality varies from day to day, depending on uh, weather conditions, depending on whether people are commuting or not, the day of the week, whether factories are open, and so on and so forth. But by combining this intelligence from satellite technology with on-the-ground sensor deployments, right, you could, for example, and, and high-resolution weather model, dispersion model, you could look at correlation between tr uh, transport, transportation, and air quality and pollution. If you link this with, say, health data, and you look at the incidence of particular uh, respiratory disease, you can try to get a, a finer understanding of the impact of planning decision for transports, like having a motorway go through the center of a town, what is the impact of that decision on public health? Is that something we can ignore? Can we try to quantify in some ways the impact of those planning decisions on, on public health? I think it's very important. Second one, also uh, covered in part by uh, the previous speaker, is to do about the use of social media as a way to identify at a very early stage outbreaks of particular disease. So this example, the top one from health, healthmap.org, looks at foot and mouth, uh, various pest, avian influ influenza, and so on and so forth, right? And the idea is to be able to contain these particular outbreaks before they become full-scale uh, epidemics. So uh, they combine basically data from uh, real-time social media with very sophisticated computer models trying to identify how is it likely to develop as a full-scale epidemics. Uh, how can we control it? How is, where is it going to propagate? The second work is very interesting. That's a group in Virginia Tech. And they have been developing models for the past 20 years. And I'm told very successfully looking at H1N1, Ebola, Zika virus across South America and North America. Right. So it shows again the extent of the, the data diversity. Now, I will go back closer to home and look at the Irish context. So where do we stand on big data? What are we doing about it? And what, what can we do better, basically? So I suppose the place to start is to say there was no shortage of policy documents, now there are many more than those, but this is the one I'm the most familiar with as part of my, as part of my job. National Research Prioritization, APJ, report on the APJ, is that excellent report on the HRB, here's the blue report. And the observation that was made is that the APJ 13 identified big data analytics as one of the key disruptive uh, technologies for Ireland. And I think um, the opportunities was identified at the right time, we were among the early adopters. And certainly, the level of resources made available for scientific research was very significant. I think we're all aware of the tens of millions that were invested in various SFI research centers. But there is a but, which is that because volume wasn't regarded as an important component of big data, we are still suffering from a chronic infrastructure deficit in Ireland. And I consider this to be a major a major problem, and one which is as a long tail of, of consequences. Because as, as we have seen through previous talks as well, right, you need data in order to make deep learning work. Right? And if you have nowhere to store your data, then you're in trouble. Right? And this is going to affect precision medicine, climate, adaptation, climate change adaptation, adaptation, or more broadly, any domain that intends to use deep learning as a tool. Right. So looking at challenges we need to overcome, there are 
essentially of three different types, technical, that's the easy stuff, structural, yeah, a bit more complicated, but still perfectly manageable. And the final one is political, I think, which is far more significant. So technical challenges are easy, but contain steps which are very often overlooked. So if you look at resources, it is, in my opinion, extremely important to ensure that whatever team is put in place includes a blend of technologists, genuine technology experts, and very importantly, domain specialists. So the ability to combine these two categories of people and make them work effectively as a team is absolutely crucial. We saw an example of that earlier for the Stanford uh, example, for a PSC example, right? Uh, also, the funding commitments need to cover all aspects of the service. You can't just fund hardware and just ignore people and running costs. It just doesn't make any sense, right? So we need to get a more holistic approach to, to services. The second one is about uh, basically requirement specification. Performance functionality relatively easy to scope, but more importantly, data governance constraints. In particular, not only about GDPR, in health research, you tend to handle data with personal information, very sensitive data, sometimes genomics data. And uh, this, understanding this particular aspect can be quite, quite difficult and may necessitate experts to be brought, in, uh, brought into the team as well. If you reach that step, it's happy days, right? You do the fun bit, which is to design, deploy, and operate the infrastructure. Uh, two aspects, again, which are commonly overlooked. The first one, we're looking at an annualized commitment. You don't just sign a check, launch a particular piece of infrastructure, and forget about it. It is a long-term, if not open-ended commitment from, from the state or whomever takes responsibility for supporting this, this particular service. And the final one, managing complexity, is that unless you are careful and you understand what you do, you are going to end up with an infrastructure that's not going to perform to expected levels. So you don't need to understand this block diagram if you are not a computer scientist. It probably look, looks like gibberish, but suffice to say that an architecture is composed of a number of different layers, and each layer has a different number of options, of technical options, right? And if you try to be everything to everyone, you end up with very bloated, very expensive, unstable, and typically an infrastructure that doesn't perform as, as expected. Uh, the cloud has a part to play in this, for example, archiving services and so on. We are not uh, excluding the cloud from this type of architecture, <coughs> far from it. Um, the second point, I think, uh, last, is, is quite important also. We have a concept, we say, data as gravity. I mean, of course, when you speak about petabytes of data, you can't just move a petabyte from one site to a different site and expect it to be in re near real time. Believe it or not, in many cases, when you want to transfer large, uh, large data sets, you are better off shifting your servers and your disk into a truck and sending a truck across the US than trying to do it over the network. That's something people don't realize, right? It's one thing to stream a movie, it's a different matter if you try to, to stream 10 or 100 petabytes of data. It doesn't work the same way, okay? Um, so collocation of compute and big data is particularly important if you consider using deep learning as an analytical tool. And you can't really have some kind of afterthought, so committing to a particular architecture and six months down the line say, oh, I want to do deep learning on that, on that data set because the cost of reverse engineering is just not, uh, not affordable. Structural challenges are a bit more uh, complex in some way, easy enough to understand, but it takes a bit of goodwill, I suppose, to address those. The first one is to really stick to a top-down approach from policy to implementation. So we have no shortage of policy documents out there we saw earlier in, uh, from various government departments. I'm yet to see a proper infrastructure roadmap at national level. I mean, I've gone through all these policy documents. I'm yet to see one of those documents providing a clear infrastructure roadmap from the perspective of the country. Right? So requirement for long-term support is also very often lacking. It's not about having another PRTLI, signing a big check for a piece of equipment or building. It requires a long-term commitment. And the final problem, I feel also, is a need for greater awareness and alignment with EU initiatives. 
right? And particularly, and including health research, there are legal difficulties about data protection and so on. But you've seen where the size of data sets is particularly important. As a small country in particular, we may have very limited subsets of particular medical data. It makes sense for us to be part of a much greater EU initiative, right? So we need to make sure that whatever <coughs> infrastructure or service we develop for Ireland will integrate within an EU framework. So I think alignment with the EU is also another important aspect. The second one is the current mechanism to address research organization requirements is currently bottom-up instead of top-down. So the way to do it's done currently is to open a call, uh, speak to members of the research community and say, tell us what equipment you like, and it can be anything. And then it's like comparing pears and apples. There is no actual top-down perspective on what's needed at a national level. So it leads to gaps, and it leads to duplication, which I think is not a very good use of public money. It also leads to balkanization of resources. The so next structural challenge, we have a tendency also, apologies for being a bit negative, there's a lot of positive to follow as well, but we have a tendency to, to look at the world in a very binary manner compared to other countries. So it tends to be an academic proof of concept, typically on a best effort basis, typically a couple of PhD students will make it run, you know, and it doesn't work over the weekend or in the evening, well, the big deal. Or we go for a full-fledged commercial tender. And the problem we failed to recognize the opportunity of embracing what I call the third way. It will make sense when I approach the, the, the case study of Scotland where they brought institutes of technology, special technology uh, experts uh, to help build a service that the state, the uh, Scottish state actually uh, relies, relies on. I covered this. Now it was very uh, case in point, uh, actually the Techno Technopolis group did run on behalf of the Department of Jobs back in 2015 an exercise called Call for Dreams. So basically coming to us in the community and saying, tell me what you want. If money was no object, what would you want? What piece of infrastructure would you like? And then they put everything together and looked at it on a sectoral basis. And I was part of the ICT group. And interestingly enough, seven different groups, and that was about a third of the audience, asked for data management infrastructure. So huge level of duplication. However, nobody, nobody mentioned we are solely data centers. So that leads to a problem, a big gap, because <coughs> if we don't have proper data centers, where are we going to put our equipment? So this is what I'm saying, that by adopting a top-down uh, approach to national infrastructure requirement, you eliminate this risk of replication and, and gaps. The final one also is about the importance of cross-departmental solutions. I think they maximize both value and function. They stop reinventing the wheel, but they also make it far easier to work on linked data across various agencies or government departments. But very often what we encountered when discussing this was fears both about double funding and about a possible cost subsidy across various departments. So again, it's more a cultural uh, issue here than a genuinely structural challenge. The, the third and maybe more difficult aspect is political challenges. So again, I did include here the uh, excellent HRB. I, I should stop saying it's excellent. I think I'm overselling the report, but I, I actually uh, uh, was interviewed by Rose Moran from the Health Research Board who, who produced that document. And I have to say it was extremely thorough process and, and it is reflected in the quality of that document. Now, if you are particularly interested in discussions on legislative framework, need for changes in legislation, please refer to that document in chapter two. It is covered in some, in some detail. But I'm not going to comment on legislative framework, it's not really my domain, but about the need to balance public interest with the right to privacy. And it is something, in my opinion, that they addressed particularly well in the UK. They had established a committee uh, chaired by somebody called uh, Dame Fiona Caldicott in 1997, and they came up with the first set of so-called Caldicott principles that were updated 15 years later, later in 2012. These are the seven principles, and I will just point out the last one. The duty to share information can be as important as the duty to protect patient confidentiality. Right? And it was reflected in the establishment of a dedicated panel called the uh, Public Benefit and Privacy Panel, that assesses specifically whether a request for 
data, confidential data, is actually of sufficient public interest to, to, to warrant its access. That's very important. And the third, third point I felt also which is missing is a public champion. We need more public champions out there uh, engaging with the public right, and explaining the benefits of uh, li data linkages. So I'll give you an example. If you look in Scotland, which I'll cover again later, and I mentioned the chief medical officer, Andrew Morris, I think his research led to a reduction of amputation linked to diabetes of 40%. 40% reduction in amputation. I don't know about the economic value of this finding, but certainly the societal impact of this, this outcome is very significant indeed. And when you come up with this type of research, this type of use of data, I think you are far more likely to receive great support from the population. And indeed, more than acceptance, you want the population to be driving the political class to embrace and uh, deploy this type of technology to improve healthcare delivery. Now, I managed to avoid talking about the clouds until now, almost, but I know many people are very dogmatic about the cloud computing. Cloud computing is a magical, magical being, a magical object. It takes all your problems away. You don't have to do something. I'll put it in the cloud. Ah, ah sure. Right. So they have a role to play, but I think there is a fundamental and maybe slightly controversial question. Can we trust those companies whose business model is exploiting data? And while I, I, I very much welcome the vision that Joel uh, presented, and I, I, I found it extremely depressing. Because at the end of the day, the question is, where is this data? Where is it going? Who controls it? What are they doing with it? i tell you one thing. Some of you must have Fitbits. Right? Say your Fitbit fails. Call a pickup line, got a problem. The device is no longer working. Please organize a replacement. You know the funny things I'm going to tell you? Well, oh, I can see you went to bed at that time yesterday and you fell asleep at that time. Do you want a random person in a random country to know what you're up to, when you go to bed, what you do in bed, and whatever? I think it's a gross invasion of privacy. Right? So this is true for your sleep patterns. This is also going to be true about your heart rate, your blood pressure, and so on. And what do you think will happen? Those will be sold to health insurance companies, and magically your premiums will go up because your lovely little device is actually feeding information to healthcare providers that, oh, that guy or that lady have a problem with their, with their uh, blood sugar or with their blood pressure, right? So I wouldn't quite embrace the revolution, the con con consumer revolution that was discussed earlier. But yeah, can we trust those businesses whose model it is to exploit data, right? So some would say GDPR is here to protect us. I'm still a little bit skeptical until GDPR actually imposed very significant fine to act as a deterrent. This company will keep on stretching and stretching and stretching to see how far they can get away with. What measures can be taken to prevent vendor lock-in? Now, vendor lock-ins are extremely subtle, and I'll come to it. I'm not the only one to be worried about this. The European Commission are extremely concerned about the risk of vendor lock-in by large corporations. So again, we need to understand that aspect far more carefully. So they'll make it very cheap for you to put your data into a cloud. Then guess what's next? Because of that concept of data having gravity, the only place where you can undertake analysis will be their own compute platform. And this is where the profit is being made. Then try to take your data away. Oh, you'll realize it costs you a fair bit of money to get the data out. Oh. And furthermore, it might cost you money to access your own data in the cloud. I was given an anecdotal, so it's a single data point, but somebody from the research community here in Ireland who uh, was taking a course, fast AI course, and subscribed to one of the private clouds, public clouds, sorry, and expected to pay three US dollars. They ended up paying 180 US dollars, not really what they had signed up for. So be careful. Um, and, and finally, yes, we need to understand the business model on how they make their money. Ultimately, they are in it for the money. So moving from that, I think it's a transition, really, to the revision of a public sector information directive from the European Commission. I think it's particularly interesting because it provides, actually, a very interesting discussion of the four, the four key objectives. You know, they do realize the value of public sector data, right? And they want, really, to make sure that Europe benefits as much as possible from the value of these data, the values that are close to 200 billion 
euros by 2040. So the first aspect is to change legislation to lower market entry for SMEs. SMEs are where innovation takes place, right? SMEs are really the ones creating jobs, creating innovation, creating wealth. The second one is to increase the availability of data, and in particular to allow this kind of cross-domain analysis. And they are planning to broaden the directive to utility companies, to transport companies, or to any work undertaken by private company on public sector data. The third one is to minimize the excessive first mover advantage. This is where the vendor lock-in comes in. And you have actually an excerpt here from the policy document, which has public data holders sometimes enter arrangements with private sector to derive extra value. This creates the risk of lock-in of public sector data. And this is clearly preventing the first objective, which is to lower market entry. Okay, so it's not just me, but being paranoid about the risk of locking the commission also certainly share very similar concerns. And the fourth one, of course, is try to standardize access to those data. API means application programming interface. It is the way in which you can query a data source to extract data out of it. So I will conclude with a brief presentation of a case study in Scotland. And I think the place to start is at the beautiful Scottish Parliament in Holyhood in Edinburgh. If you haven't been there, it's actually a phenomenal place and very nice piece of architecture. But the ambition that's stated in that document is to build on existing programs. So I love the sense of continuity. Now, the sense of continuity is part of sustainability. We just don't reinvent the wheel. We leverage pre-existing investments. To create a culture, which I think we undervalue the importance of culture, but to create a culture where legal, ethical, and secure linkages are not only accepted by the general population, but more importantly, expected. In other words, the general population would put pressure on the political class to embrace technology to provide uh, improved public services. And the main institute actually in charge of delivering on this vision in health is the Far Institute, or at least in Scotland, the Scottish node of the Far Institute. And again, we cover, I think it is important to look at their mission, to harness health data for patient and public benefit. So they place clearly and firmly societal impact ahead of economic impact. And I think this is all too often a mistake, in my opinion, we are making, is always to be obsessed with jobs and economic growth and so on and so forth. Stick societal impact. A healthy and happy population are more likely to vote for you if you're a politician, but they are also far more likely to be productive and the economy to pick up as a result as well. So put the emphasis on societal impact and you will get broad, not only user acceptance, but the, uh, the population will, will push for further reforms to be introduced in terms of technology. So I, I worked 10 years in EPCC in Edinburgh, so I'm very familiar. I kept a lot of very good friends there. So I said, listen, what, what was the driving force for this to happen? And I said, well, you know, the main one was social justice. It wasn't create jobs. It wasn't grow GDP by X person. It was social justice. And what came out, it identified that within a few hundred meters, going from you know, very posh parts of Glasgow and going to a very rundown part of Glasgow a few hundred meters away, the variation in life expectancy was over a decade. Over a decade, right? So for a Western European country, is it acceptable to get affluent part of a city where you got a life expectancy of 81 years and further down the road, you go down to 70 years, including a third of your life with a combination of chronic disease. So poor quality of life, right? And the answer is no. And there was a big drive from the Scottish government backed up by the population and the press to say, we need to do something about it. We need to understand better all this public data to help us put in place framework to basically uh, limit this type of inequalities in population. Right. So I think it was truly remarkable. Main driving force wasn't economic. It was about so social justice. It was about societal impact. Now, the Far Institute has a set of very compelling case studies, a hundred ways of using data to make lives better. Again, it's about making lives better, not about uh, commercializing 
uh, health service. So have a look at this, it's a particularly interesting uh, resource. An important aspect of the Far Institute was the way in which they approached EPCC. So EPCC are the equivalent organization to iCheck, my own organization, but you know, they're in Scotland. Um, they're looking at supercomputers and exploiting novel technologies to develop uh, new services. So it's very similar to, to what we do here in Ireland. But they're one step ahead in terms of the roles they're playing for the Scottish executive. And indeed, they're operator of the NHS Scotland National Safe Heaven. So if you, if you don't know what Safe Heaven is, that's a, a, a simple explanation here. This is putting in place a framework, both hardware and software, that allows you to gain access to unconsented data, right, within specific restrictions on uh, confidentiality and so on and so forth. So, so the way it works, if you are a social, say, a social science researcher, right, and you want to look at a specific problem, you approach an organization called EDRIS in, in the NHS Scotland that acts as a single point of contact for the 14 NHS trusts. They help you prepare an application. You need to formulate a specific problem you are trying to address. Based on that, they actually uh, help you to define what type of data do you need access to. And you are only able to access the minimum amount of data you need to answer the particular problem of concern. Right? And it is made available for a secure environment. Typically, that's a secure lock-in Windows environment. You've got all the usual stuff called tool, SPSS, data, and so on and so forth. Right? But there are a number of safeguards, uh, very strong data oversight. If, for example, a hit returns fewer than 20 results, it removes everything because it considers that the risk of you being able to identify patients for that very small subset is just unacceptable, and therefore it refuses to give, you, to, to, to give you answers. But they have a very, very strong data governance in place. They have a very strong level of transparency. Uh, the public benefit and privacy panel is a very strong group of 16 uh, experts, and you have other strong data governance structure. Now, EPCC are actually delivering, if you want, the hardware and software component of that service. They had to, went to go through very thorough certifications from ISO certification. GCHQ are the spies, you know, the spy agents, the people listening to communications. So actually you went to EPCC to audit the infrastructure and make sure it was meeting acceptable levels of, of security. Um, and as a result of which, it is now fully qualified to host the NHS national data sets as well as data from the Department of Works and Pension, DWP, in Scotland. It is also fully qualified to host uh, the National Image Archive, right? So please have a look at these. I provided the URL. It provides a lot more information about, about what those guys are doing. So some general observations from the Scottish case studies. I picked up five. The first one, I think, is they benefited from a very favorable environment, right? Uh, the Scottish executive had a clear vision for this. They were focusing primarily on social justice. They were focusing on societal impact. A uh, strong policy framework. They also benefited, I was stunned to, to see that, from having a community health identifier, index number, sorry, or the Kali number since the 70s. They had a unique ID for health since the 70s. And 95% of the population in Scotland currently have a Kali number, including armed forces and so on, right? So when you go to register to a GP in Scotland, you are given one of these, these Kali numbers. Right? So I think it really helped in order to do these data linkages to have this unique identifier in place, right? So they started much earlier than us. Also, that pre-existing platform, like this uh, Scottish Health Information uh, Ship uh, Initiative, they were able to build on. They have a very strong, streamlined data governance uh, structure. So I mentioned the, the, the main two structures, which are uh, bodies, which are this EDRIS, which provides the single point of contact for the 14 NHS Trust in Scotland, but also helps you in preparing and formulating the question you want to look at and preparing the case for access to the data. It's very important. So it streamlines the process. Uh, the second one, of course, is this public benefit and privacy panel that actually monitors the effective implementation of the seventh canonical principle about weighing public interest versus right, personal, uh, right to privacy. 
Um, the first aspect I liked about the Scottish model is they are extremely pragmatic. Pragmatic at two levels. First of all, in recognizing the role that can be played by technology organizations such as EPCC, which in my opinion brings the best of both the private sector and the public sector, right? So they actually give you leading edge technology as a kind of cost you wouldn't be able to attain from a, a private company, but also you are sure they won't do anything funny with your data, which I think is very important, right? Uh, they also adopt a very proportional, proportionate approach to data access, to data governance. So they classify data in four different categories, from fully open data to genomics data, the top end, and the terms and conditions of access are uh, increasingly onerous as the sensitivity of the data grows. Remarkably, and I think, I think this is uh, probably a very important point, looking at continuity over time and leveraging pre-existing investments. Currently, two different projects have been approved. The first one, called ADRP, Scottish Administrative Data Research Partnership, is extending the safe haven to host data, education records, police and judicial records, census data, emergency services. Right? So the ability to cross-link all these different government data to break departmental silos will provide a, a decision support infrastructure of tremendous capability. Right? So in terms of informing policy, I think Scotland are in the process of deploying really an infrastructure of extremely valuable infrastructure. Uh, the last one also uh, linking data and artificial intelligence is the establishment of that center, so I call it eye care, I don't know if it's the right way to say it, I couldn't say it with a Scottish accent, but basically it's about looking at the industrial use of AI on digital diagnostics data. So examine AI in healthcare, basically, and some of the key uh, industry partners for this are Canon Imaging and, and uh, Philips uh, Medical. Right. The question at the bottom for the audience, for the HRB and the department and journalists, which of the above can be applied in the Irish context? What lessons do we choose to learn from the experience of our Scottish friends? So I came up with four recommendations. The first one is calling for the need for much greater international benchmarking, right? But instead of doing a very broad kind of exercise, focus clearly on infrastructure for big data and artificial intelligence, for deep learning. Right. I think we need to keep focus here. We need to tighten alignment with European initiatives. There are a number of initiatives out there. We need to make sure that whatever services and infrastructure we develop in the country actually will integrate within the European infrastructure, a pan-European infrastructure, without too much difficulties. And also, are there any relevant lessons we can learn from other countries? I think clearly in the case of Scotland, I believe this is the case. Now, I should mention, by the way, that's a, that excellent, I say it one more time, report from the HRB actually includes in-depth discussion about both the Scottish model and the different model taken in Swansea um, also. So this has been caught on by the HRB. The second one, which is a short-term need to address this chronic infrastructure deficit, and I think it starts by adopting this top-down approach and drawing up a hot map, an infrastructure hot map for the country. I think, I think something we need to address fairly quickly. Reassess and emphasize the role of technologists within the whole public sector delivery. Uh, so the national research prioritization clearly defined two different layers, horizontal layers called integrating infrastructure and platform science technology, and I think the difficulties I felt they were, those were not supported to a sufficient level. I think they were seen as existing in their own right, but the connection, the way they were underpinning all these vertical disciplines wasn't correctly understood. And I'm suggesting, should we use this revised PSI directive? Should we use the DTIF as disruptive technology innovation funds as a framework to actually deploy this kind of technologies and, and researchers partnerships. The final point is to consider new approaches to public engagement. So I don't know about you, but when I take a taxi, I like to speak to the man, speak to the driver or lady, why not? And about various things in society and so on. It always end up talking about technology and, and so on. And I saw a very high level of suspicion. People are very suspicious 
of what the state is up to with their own private data. There is a, a significant level of distrust. And I think it's very important to gain public acceptance. Right? It is almost pointless to develop an infrastructure unless we have not only acceptance, but in my opinion, the general public would be pushing for the development and deployment of these more sophisticated services. And as suggested, there are significant funds available for the disruptive technology innovation funds, half a billion euro over 20 years. This could provide a very effective vehicle to actually implement this type of services. At the moment, the focus for DETIF is primarily on economic development, on economic impact. I would argue there's a need to shift this from economic impact onto societal impact, and that <coughs> economic impact will just follow societal impact. A happy, healthy population works harder, doesn't get sick, right, and the economy picks up as a result. So it would be my final piece of advice. Thank you very much. <laughs>